I meet with a, another minister of the gospel about once every six weeks. And I love meeting with him because he loves to draw on napkins as we talk. And I get to take the napkins home and I get to preach it. Yes. <laughs> and um, it's just good because he just, he just sees Jesus, the living word, in everything. And um, he was telling me about someone and he's, he's quite happy. He doesn't, he's not really like the pastor of a church or anything. Um, he's quite happy where he is doing what God's called him to do. But they had somebody come and do a men's meeting a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to see if I can get him here. He's actually not a minister, but he's a Christian. He's a kingdom man, and he's an adventurer. I can't remember his name. Look, he didn't write that on the napkin. <laughs> can't remember his name, but I know where to get the information. <laughs> And he often, um, if, if anybody knows him, let me know, like if you know the name. He uh, has, has gone across the South Pole. He does amazing like feats like that just because he wants to. Like, but he does. So he goes along the South Pole. Um, he's, done, uh, he's got a vet surgery here on the Gold Coast somewhere, I think. We think. We're not 100% sure. But he does this kind of stuff. Like he loves just wild adventure. <laughs> So he takes off and he does it. And there's been several times when he's rung his wife like on satellite phone and said, this is it. I don't think I'm going to make it home this time. Because, you know, if you're in the middle of the South Pole and stuff's going on, you might not be able to make it home. <laughs> so um, there was one time when um, and he travels, not with a dog and, you know, huskies and a sled, Oh, you can tell I'm so with it today. He doesn't travel like that, but he's got some kind of a kite thing, like a, you know, like you see over the water, people on the kites, um, kite, you know, glider. glider thing. Thank you, Tara. I knew kite was wrong, glider thing. And he travels across the snow on that, but the wind has got to be moving and the wind's got to be going in the right direction. So there was one time when he was, I think it was the South Pacific, uh, South, South Pole, not the South Pacific, South Pole, and he was stuck because there was no wind and if there was any wind, it was headed in the wrong direction so he couldn't use the glider. He had lost two weeks of rations, so he had cut back to half rations for the day and he'd rung his wife and it was one of those, I don't think I'm going to make it home, court phone calls. And uh, she said, are you okay? Have you been drinking or something? She, your words are all slurring together, like what's going on? And he said, oh, no. He said, I've, I've lost two weeks' worth of rations. Um, this is happening, that's happening, and, and I'm just really tired and, and, and hungry. And she said, go back to full rations and have a good night's sleep. Just sleep. Go back to full rations and it'll be fine. So she's obviously praying back here. But what he does when things go wrong is he actually pounds the ground, right? God. He actually pounds the ground. And what he says is, I want to redeal. So, you know, I've never played poker, but there is a thing when you play cards that you can ask for a redeal and everybody's cards come back in and there's a shuffle and they're redealt out. You want to redeal? So that's what he's asking. He says, God, I want to redeal. This isn't good enough. Uh, or, you know, like the wind's going in the wrong direction. I've lost provision, da da da. I want to redeal. And he pounds the ground. He says, I want to redeal. You're in covenant with God. Is any look, if you read the Lord's Prayer, don't look at me like I'm whatever it is you're looking at me like. But if you read the Lord's Prayer in, the, in a Hebrew, the one new man Bible, it actually says, I want my daily bread now. It's, it's a demand. It's a covenant demand. He is your father, but you have a covenant with God. And in that covenant, he says, I have given you everything. And we have given him everything. A covenant is like that. And that's why covenants are made. They're made between strong tribes and weak tribes. So that when there's trouble for the weak tribe, they go to the strong tribe and say, hey, we're being attacked or this has happened. And the strong tribe comes to their rescue. And occasionally there's something that the weak tribe has that the strong, they might have a wisdom or something that the strong tribe wants. But God is our strong one, right? We're in covenant with a strong one. And when life is not going the way you expect, make sure you're listening. But you can ask for a redeal. You can ask for a redeal. Charles, we want a redeal and a new home for you with no stairs. 
Yeah. We want to redeal. We want to redeal. And so you can actually do that. And there was one time when he was going, I don't know, South Pole, North Pole, I don't know, wherever he was, but he took his son-in-law for him for fun. <laughs> <laughs> And the wind's not blowing and they're not going anywhere and he's got his glider on the snow and he's actually pounding it with his hand and his son-in-law looks over and he thinks, I've done something wrong. I've upset him. What have I done? So he says, are you upset with me? Have I done something? Like, because you really, he says, no, why would you think that? Well, you're really pounding the ground. And he says, no, he says, I do that when I want to redeal. He said, we can't move because the wind's not, not going in the right direction. We want to redeal. He said, it's not, it's not, I want to redeal. And so, and he says, whenever I want to redeal, I pound the ground. Does it count? He got, it turns, he said, every time it turns around. Every time it turns around. See, we accept a lot of stuff. We accept a lot of things that are not God's plan for our lives. We accept delays. We accept um, all sorts of rubbish. We accept things because, oh, you never know what God's going to do. Or, you know, well, I've prayed and I'm believing, but that's passive. I'm not saying that you, you, you know, have a hissy fit in front of the throne, but I am saying I want to redeal. I want to redeal. And I think there's everyone in here, people on Zoom, where you want to redeal. Where stuff's happened, we think it's not right, it's not fair, I've never done anything to deserve this. As far as I knew, everything was working out okay. I want to redeal because this doesn't look like it's God. I want to redeal. God, deal the hand again. And you're not angry at God. You're saying, hey, this stuff is coming from the pits of hell and I am not going to accept it. So, look, honestly, if God was really guilty of the stuff that we say, I'm just waiting for God to do this, or I'm, you know, he would be the most abusive father in history. He is amazing. He is absolutely amazing, but we tend to think stuff that's going wrong and so we come before him and say da-da-da and it's almost like we accuse him of not caring, not loving, not providing, not healing, not coming through for us when we need it. It's all God's fault. But in reality, you've got an enemy that just wants to strip you of everything. He just wants to steal, kill and destroy anything that's precious to God and you are precious to God, so he's after you. But we come before God and says, well, I've, I've prayed, I've done this, I've done that, I've, I've, I've. It's all about Jesus. It's not about us. It's what Jesus did at the cross for us. And we are in Christ. I'm in him. Christ is in me. So whatever Christ did at the cross, he, I, I was co-crucified with Jesus. I was co-buried with Jesus. I am co-raised with Jesus. I'm co-ascended with Jesus. And if, wherever Jesus, it's us. But we accept this rubbish. We accept it. And we think God's withholding, just like Eve did. But it's the enemy. And sometimes it's our own stinking thinking. Sometimes we just are listening to the unrenewed part of our mind instead of to our spirit. So it's, it's recognizing that you can ask for a redeal. You don't have to accept life the way it is, but before you go for a redeal, I want you to do one thing. I want you to do a John 5, 19, where I want you to listen to the Father because we can leave the story too early, we close the book before the, the, the chapter's finished. As my son said months ago, leave the conversation too early. Or even with the colours that we went through last week, we can leave before we get to the Kingdom one, we can leave at any time during that, that thing. So it's recognising, for goodness sake, that the Father has a story that he is wanting to unfold through your life that's going to bring him glory and bring fame to the name of Jesus. And you're going to be astounded. But we don't listen for the Father's purpose. We're not intent on following through with what his story is. Like, he doesn't, 
bring sickness and disease upon us, but he will use what's there to bring glory to him in the healing, in the deliverance, in the salvation, all of that. So, you know, like we've got a, we've got such, Pentecostalism is full of religion. Pentecostalism is full of religion and tradition, just as, main, just as much as mainline churches. We have our own brand. It's just that we're happier doing it, we're noisier doing it, but it's just as religious and just as traditional as mainline churches. How about just having a relationship with Jesus? Just a relationship. Just walk through life with Jesus. Is that so hard? We don't have to know the seven steps of this and the five things of that. You don't need to know any. You just need to know Jesus. He's my hero. I've given up waiting for the guy in the natural. I'll just go with, with Jesus, my king and my hero. But he's amazing. He's wonderful. You know, he speaks life. He's continually surprising. He's unique. And yet so often, because we read the word in a certain way, we don't see how amazing Jesus is. We're not astonished at the miracles in the word of God because we're so used to it. There's such a spirit of familiarity in our relationship with Jesus at times, that we lose any spark of intimacy. We get too familiar. Too familiar. Too familiar. And I haven't forgotten about the words of knowledge or the words of wisdom, but we're going to redeal first. We're redealing. So I'm going to read 43 or 44 verses or something, so don't be shocked. But turn to John 11. We're looking at Lazarus. Talk about anybody who needed a redeal. Lazarus did, right? And all of us can feel that there are things in our life that are pretty well dead. The destiny that God gave us, the dreams that he gave us years ago, um, our, our career, our finances. There's probably areas in each one of our lives where we think, yeah, it's pretty much as dead as it's going to get. And we even stop praying about it. Or if we pray about it, we are just waiting for it to manifest. But faith is now. And if I say I'm waiting for it to manifest, I'm putting the manifestation off into the future. But you, know, you, gotta, you, you need a redeal. You need to actually get a little bit righteously angry and have a redeal. This is not acceptable, God. I'm walking in a covenant with you. I'm anointed by the Holy Spirit. You love me. I'm your daughter. This just is not an acceptable situation. But I want to hear your side of it first. I want to hear your side of it before I go for, a, you know, pound the ground. I, you talk to me first, and then I'll know whether or not to pound the ground, okay? So in John 5, 19... If you base your life on John 5:19, you can do it, it'll just be so different for you. Jesus answered by saying, I assure you, the Son is able to do nothing of himself. He can't do anything of his own accord. He can't do anything on his own initiative. But he's able to do only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does is what the Son does in the same way. So Jesus is saying, I'm not going to go with self-will. I'm not going to go with what I want. I want what my Father wants. I'm not going to take the initiative. I'm not going to, you know, jump out and do what I think. I want to hear what my Father is saying. And in verse 20, I love this. It says, the Father so dearly loves the Son that he shows him everything that he himself is doing. And he will disclose to him greater things yet than these, so that you may marvel and be full of wonder and astonishment. I want to marvel. I want to be full of wonder and astonishment at how amazing Jesus is, right? So first of all, Father, what is it you're saying in this? What is it that you're showing me in this? So that I can, I can work with you purposefully intentionally. Often I feel like I'm a two-year-old kid skipping off in the wrong direction and the father's hand's got to come out and say, this way. This way. Instead of living intentionally and purposefully doing the father's will. 
If you if you live by John 5, 19 and you believe verse 20 that the Father delights to show you these things, everything will change for you. But in John chapter 11, and I've got the Amplified, so I'll try and cut out all the stuff in brackets. A certain man named Lazarus was ill, and he was of Bethany, the village where Mary and her sister Martha lived. And this Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. So they had a history with Jesus. If you go back into Luke, you'll find that he, he stayed at their place. Mary sat at his feet and Martha was too busy getting things together to really listen to much. But he's got a history. He's got a relationship with these people. And it was her brother Lazarus who was now sick. So the sisters sent to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is sick. So they're pulling on the relationship. It's okay to pull on your relationship with Jesus. So verse 4, when Jesus received the message, he said, now Lazarus is just sick at this point of time. He's not dead. He's just sick. But in verse 4, Jesus received the message and he said, this sickness is not to end in death. But it is to honour God and to pr promote his glory that the Son of God may be glorified through it. This sickness is not to end in death. So he's saying that the sickness is not unto death. There has to be an unfolding of, of, the, of an unfolding of a story. There are things that have to, to sort of roll out before anything can happen for Lazarus to walk through. Does this make sense? So, so often, you know, like my son said, we leave the conversation before it's finished. I can close a book before I finish the chapter. Um, you know, we can work our way through the green and the black and the, all of those colours but not get to the kingdom. So we've got to listen to what God is saying. So Jesus gets this message that Lazarus is sick. It does not say Lazarus is dead, but Jesus gets a word of knowledge and he says, now this is not going to end up in death. It's not going to end in death. <coughs> so don't leave the conversation too early, don't leave before the story ends. We have to allow God to unfold the story of our lives. It's a story and it's the, it is to spread the fame of the name of Jesus everywhere we go. But allow the story to unfold. And, and let me just say this, because I have been shocked at times, shocked at God, like seriously, you want me to walk through this? Hello. But once you've given your life to Jesus, once you've surrendered lordship over to him, you cannot predict what he's going to do with your life. Doesn't that make you feel confident? But you cannot predict where God is going to take you and what he is going to do or where you're going to end up. But you do know that love is in charge of the whole story. Love is in charge of it. But all because we live in a Western society, you know, it's, we, we, are, we get numbed by our culture. We're numbed by it. And we think, oh, well, you know, like I'm a Christian now, I'm born again, I'm spirit-filled, I mean, I know I'm, I'm involved in, in open heaven or I've, I'm involved in this prayer group, I'm doing this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a kingdom citizen. And we, we kind of think along those lines and we kind of predict what our life is going to be like. Well, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to do this. This is going to happen. I'll get married, have kids, whatever. We've got this story that we think in our head we can predicate what our life is going to look like. But you've just given ownership of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has the right to tell you to do anything he wants because it's covenant. But love will always speak through him. Love will always speak through him, so you can trust him. You can predict those covenant outcomes, but you are God my healer. You are God my provider. You are God my king. You are my deliverer. You are my saviour. You are my redeemer. We, we can predict covenant outcomes, but the actual journey is up to him. And we think we have a right because it's our life. It's his life that he's living through us. Because I died with Christ on the cross. I don't always remember that. Daniel can tell you all the times I don't remember that. But I was crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And, and sometimes we forget that. So we've got this, this story that God is wanting to unfold through our lives and we've got to let it unfold. In verse 4 it says, oh, we've looked at verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and he held them in loving esteem. And therefore, even when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he still stayed two days longer in that same place where he was. Now he had received a message from people he loved that his friend was sick and he needed to come, but he didn't. But it says he loved them. So he waited another two days before he left to go. That doesn't sound like much of a friend. Like if you want somebody to come because you're in dire need and you send, you know, hey, Suzette, look, I really want you to come. I need to see you. Something desperate's happening in my life. And I'll, and I'll think, oh, yeah, but you know what? I'll give it a couple of days before I go. How does that make you feel? But Jesus waited two days. Why? Because he only did what the Father told him to do. So there's an element of timing that we need to take into our stories. There's timing. The law of timing, um, it's a schedule. There's a purpose in the time. So it might look like a delay, but there's a purpose in the delay. It might look like there's no response from God, but there's an intention to add to your story that will make it more glorifying to God and better for you. So the time, the timing for Jesus to visit Lazarus, the, the, the most impact, the greatest impact he could have for the glory of God would be two days. Just wait two days, the Father says. And this is a more profound resurrection than Jairus' daughter or the widow of Nain's son, who Jesus both raised from the dead, because he raised them immediately. But here, Lazarus was in the tomb for four days. So it's not an immediate resurrection, but it is a prophetic act of what Jesus himself will be going through. And the reason for four days is that usually after that they, um, they actually really seal the rock in front of the, the grave, the tomb. But this was deliberate. This was a deliberate delay of two days. This is why you can't leave the conversation or the story too early because you might just miss out on what God is wanting to do. And that's our free will choice. So verses 7 and 8, after the interval, he said to his disciples, let's go back again to Judea. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews only recently were intending and trying to stone you. Are you thinking of going back there again? Like seriously, you didn't get the best of receptions. You want to go back? And Jesus answered, aren't there 12 hours in the day? Anyone who walks about in the daytime does not stumble because he sees by the light of this world. But if anyone walks about in the night, he does stumble because there's no light in him. Do you know when I'm walking in the dark is when I have not listened to my father. When I think this is a good thing to do and I have not listened to my father, that's when I'm stumbling in the dark. But Jesus said, you know, when you walk in the light, it's a clear course. The confusion comes and the stumbling comes when we're not... Um, we're not listening to the Father. But we want a redeal. We're going to pound the ground for a redeal. In verse 11, he said these things and then added, Our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I'm going there to awaken him. And the disciples answered and said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll recover. However, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he referred to falling into a natural sleep. But Jesus had a word of knowledge, Lazarus is dead. Now, when the message first came to him, he was sick. So no other message had come to Jesus, but he knew by a word of knowledge that Lazarus had died. But he used the word sleep. And the reason... <coughs> that sometimes we just need to be very careful about the words that we use. So in verse 14, Jesus told them very plainly, Lazarus is dead. 
and for your sake I'm glad that I wasn't there. It will help you to believe. However, let us go to him. So one of the reasons that he delayed was to help the disciples to believe and to have a deeper faith in Jesus Christ. Now, when you think about what Mary and Martha are going through, Lazarus is in the grave. Does it look like it's going to deepen your faith? It doesn't, does it? It looks like where is God when we needed him? What's going to happen? How, do, how did this happen? It doesn't look like God is there at all. But when God is nowhere to be seen, God is now here. All you've got to do is put a space between the W and the H in nowhere. He's nowhere. If you put a space between the W and the H, God is now here. It's all about perspective. And so um, this whole thing, the delay of going, uh, the whole thing was designed to strengthen the faith of the believers and it was to reveal another aspect of God, an aspect of God that they didn't know. They'd never known God as, as the resurrection and the power. They'd seen him heal. They'd seen him do a whole heap of things, but they'd never seen another. This So often what we go through is to reveal another aspect of the heart of God, something that we never knew about him before. This, oh, my gosh, I didn't know, God, you were a God of peace. Oh, really, you heal? Oh, my goodness. Oh, and God, wisdom? So everything we go through, it's like when we come together, I've got my um, perception of what I think God is. But when Jenny comes or, or John comes or, or Anne-Marie or, or Charles and they come and they say, this is what God's done for me, I think, oh, my gosh, I've never thought of God in that way. And so I then go home and I pray and say, God, I want to know you in this. I've, I've never seen that aspect of you. I want to grow in this. That's why it's so important when we come together that, that we, we share what we've learned about God. That's what I used to love about when I first got born again, like forever ago, um, straight after a church service, we'd go somewhere for lunch. It could be a park or someone's house or, or for an evening meal. And we'd, we'd all sit around the table, we'd have brought our own potluck kind of a thing, but we'd all have our Bibles open. We wouldn't be talking about work, we wouldn't be talking about the family, we would be talking about Jesus. And it was amazing and it was awesome. You know, you'd sit around and think, oh my gosh, did you hear what the pastor said? I've never thought about Jesus like that. Or, oh, I've never, I've never felt like the fire of the Holy Spirit in my life. Or, and so we'd talk about these things and prayer would erupt. And uh, it was just awesome. I was so grateful to get born again about 40 years ago or more. <laughs> But it was just a move of God, of the Word and the Spirit, and everybody was hungry. And so we'd sit around and we'd talk, and you never went anywhere without your Bible. You always had your Bible with you, and so you'd sit down and you'd have a cup of coffee at a friend's house and you'd whip the Bible out, you know, and you'd, this is what God's doing in my life. What's he doing in your life? And we'd share what Jesus was doing. And you know what? I miss it. I miss it. Because so often we talk about life which is wonderful, but it's not Jesus who is life. And so when we start to bring him in and make him the centre of the conversation, say, oh, my gosh, what's God doing in your life? Really? He's doing that? I've never, I've never thought about that. What are you, well, how, how is that working for you? And would you pray for me that I can experience that? This is what it was like. It was awesome. We would go to parks, we went to uh, restaurants, and, and oftentimes at the restaurant, one, somebody with a beautiful voice, not someone with a voice like mine, but someone would all of a sudden just sing out, sing out a spontaneous worship song. Because we've been talking about Jesus, the worship is just there. And it's like, oh, and it just had to come out. So in the middle of a restaurant with all of the other people around, this, this song of praise would come out to Jesus. It was the most glorious time to get born again. It was wonderful. It was just so alive because Jesus was more real to us than anything else and we wanted to know more about him. Whereas today, I'm not finding that so much. I'm hearing what other ministers are, you know, oh, I watch this podcast or I watch this on YouTube and that's wonderful and that's great and I do that too and I read books. <laughs> but what is Jesus actually doing with you? What journey are you on? It doesn't have to be, oh, let me take this the right way, it doesn't have to be a good journey. But what are you journeying with Jesus? What, what's the aspect of God that really ministers to you in this? Is it his peace or his comfort? 
Like, don't leave the conversation too early. Those disciples could easily have said, well, if he's dead, why bother going back? Which meant Lazarus would still be in the grave. Don't leave the conversation too early. Don't close the book when God is still writing your story. And start talking about Jesus. Spread the fame of his name. Yeshua, whatever it is that you want to call him. Yeshua, look, I go to Africa, I am Suzetti. You know, different countries pronounce my name different ways. It's the same with Jesus, Yeshua. Um, other countries, it's slightly different. Yesus. Um, Yesus, I can't get it. But, you know, but so don't worry about it. Just talk to him. He is right there beside you. He never leaves you. He's not only your king, he's your best friend. But if we don't talk to him and listen and then talk about him with others, I'm going to miss out on, what, on, on an aspect of God that I might never learn any other way. I don't want to miss out. I want to hear what God is doing. And I want you to hear what he's doing in my life because Jesus is awesome. He is my king and he's my hero. And I want to talk about him. I really will listen politely to what is going on in your life. And I will pray with you and I'll pray for you. But, man, you want to bring Jesus into the conversation, it takes a whole new level. It's just wonderful. And so if these disciples had actually listened and, and, and Jesus said, well, okay, he's dead, they could have said, well, what's the point of going back? They could have closed the book, ended the conversation, and the redeal for Lazarus would never have happened. That's why I want you to see what's going on in your life as an unfolding story. And in verse 16, because um, Jesus said, it's for your sake that this is happening. I want This is going to give you a stronger faith. But in verse 16, Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too that we may die and be killed along with Jesus. Now, isn't he a cheerful guy to have in company? Like Thomas the doubter, first of all, I don't really believe Jesus turned up, you know, at the end of the story. But right here he says, well, man, we had to leave Jerusalem because they're trying to kill him. Now he wants to go back. I guess we can go back and be killed along with him. So he's a bit pessimistic but he's also loyal because he thought, well, even if Jesus is going back and he's going to die and we are going to be killed with him, he said, I'm not, I'm not turning back. I'm staying with Jesus. So Thomas, the doubter, a bit pessimistic, demonstrated loyalty. And sometimes we forget, we absolutely forget that it's high stakes to follow Jesus. It sometimes takes guts to follow him. You know, if, you, if you've got to um, ask for someone's forgiveness or you've got to forgive somebody who literally destroyed your life, it takes guts and courage to follow Jesus. It's not for the wimps. It's not for the wusses. You've got to be courageous to follow Jesus. You've got to be bold. But Thomas the doubter, the pessimistic one who says, well, I'm going to, well, might as well go and die with him, You're the, the motivated one, um, he actually motivated the others to go. And so they were only about three kilometres away from Jerusalem. And at verse 19, a considerable number of the Jews had gone out to see Martha. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary remained sitting in the house. Now that's Martha, the doer racing out to meet Jesus while Mary, the reflective one, was sitting in the house. They're true to their personalities, right? And Martha said to Jesus, Master, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. She knew that he could heal. Verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, he'll grant it to you. She didn't believe in the resurrection at that time. She knew that if he had been alive, Jesus could heal him. She wasn't thinking about the resurrection, but she said, I know that whatever you ask from God, she said, I know that even if you pray, something good can come out of this. But she wasn't even thinking of Lazarus being raised from the dead. But he is the God of much more. 
So in verse 25, Jesus said to her, oh, um, sorry, verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha replied, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So her faith was in the future. I know that God has healed me. I know that God will pay my bills. I'm just waiting for the manifestation, future faith. That's not present faith because faith is now. Faith is now. You deal with it like you already have received it, not like you're waiting for it. So that her faith was in the future. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, although he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever continues to live and believes in me shall never die at all. Do you believe this? Do you believe that you're alive right now with eternal life? That you are eternally alive forever. Your spirit and your soul will never, ever, ever die. And to be quite frank, I'm expecting 120 years out of this earth suit, at least, and I expect it to look good until the end. He renews my youth. He is the health of my countenance. I am alive with eternal life. And so it's recognising that. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, this is the fifth I am statement of Jesus so far. So if you want to turn back, that's grace. Turn back to 635. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not be walking in the dark, but will have light, which is life. I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, verse 7 and verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door for the sheep. Verse 9, I am the door. Anyone who enters in through me will be saved. You'll come in and go out and find pasture. In 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. And that's repeated in verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know and recognise my own. My own know and recognise me. Now in verse 11, 25 and 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever continues to live in and uh, to live and believe in me shall never actually die at all. Do you believe this? And she said, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, uh, who was to come into the world. So she makes the same statement there as Peter did on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus said, what are others saying about me? Now, what are you saying about me? Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. So she's come to the same revelation that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. She's got it. And it moved Martha from a last day belief, like future tense. I know that in the last days he will be raised from the dead. It moved her from that future faith to a present day personalised trust because you've got to understand that with Jesus Christ, time is no barrier. Time is not about two days. He waited before he went back for Lazarus. When he got there, Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. Time is no barrier to the power of God, to the move of God, to the authority of Jesus Christ. Time is no barrier. And yet the doctors tell you that it is. Your accountant will tell you that it is. Your bank statements will tell you that it is. Your friends will tell you that it is. Oh, you know, but you're running out of time. I'm not running out of time. My time is in God's hands and he can stretch my time. He can shrink my time in certain situations to make it easier. He can translate me out of time. <coughs> and so I get, I get frustrated when people say, oh, but you're too busy. No, I'm not. I sometimes put too much in my day. I put too much in my day. But I'm not too busy because my times are in God's hand and I have all the time that I need in the world to do everything that he's asked me to do. And when people say, oh, but you're too busy, they're cursing you. Because we live in the rhythm of heaven, the pace of grace. So he says these, um, so Martha moved, time is no barrier. If you believe time is a barrier, you need to rethink the power of God. 
doesn't matter how many months doctors say you've got to live. I still remember my friend when the doctor says you've got so many months to left to live and she stuck her bony little finger in his face and she said, don't you dare tell me how much time I've got. That's between me and God. And she lived. She had a 5% chance of living. So, you know, time is not an issue. What is an issue is faith. What is an issue is are you listening for what God is saying in your story? Are you listening like Jesus in John 5, 19? Are you listening to the Father so that you have an understanding of the conversation, that you don't leave the conversation too early, that you don't get caught in the trap of I'm just trying to manifest my healing, my prosperity, the wisdom that I need, get my business out of where it's at. Forget all that. Just come back and what is the story, Father? What is the purpose? What are you doing in this and what do you require of me? Time is not the issue. Listening is because we get programmed in church. We get programmed in church culture. And there's a freedom with Jesus. Jesus created life. He can restore it. So in verse 27, she said, yes, Lord, and she made the same statement of commitment that Peter did on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Let me tell you about resurrection. Resurrection is superior to life because life can end, but resurrection overpowers death. Resurrection, um, life is, an, is a power to exist, but resurrection conquers even the death and the grave. And ascension is even stronger than resurrection. And we are part of the ascension generation. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are ascended with him. So people will tell you that you're just a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I am. I'm a disciple. Also means a disciplined one. I've got work to do in that area. But I'm also a, 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 a son of the Most High, if you want to keep it gendered that way. I'm a son or a daughter of the Most High God. I'm a member of his royal household. I'm seated with him in heavenly places. And yes, I did die with him and, and I, you know, I was crucified with him. I was buried with him. I've been through the baptism. I've risen out of that grave. I've risen out of, the, out of death and hell. I have resurrected into a brand new creation. But now I, we're ascended and we live from that place of ascension. That's where you live from. So we've got to hear what God, God is saying. Re and Romans 8, 11 says, The Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead lives in you and will quicken your mortal body. It will make your mortal body alive. Resurrection power destroys death and hell. So if you are facing something that looks like the death of hope, of dreams, of finances, of, of health, release resurrection power. I release the resurrection power of Christ within me. I release it. It quickens my mortal body. It will quicken my dreams. It will quicken my destiny. It will quicken my finances. It will bring things alive. Does this make sense? I want a redeal. Who wants a redeal? Lazarus needed a redeal. Danny, both hands down. Lazarus needed a redeal, <laughs> you know, and he couldn't even ask for it himself because he's in the grave. But he needed a redeal. Martha and Mary wanted a redeal. It is okay to ask for a redeal. Pound the ground. This, thank you, Charles. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <coughs> What is the significance of actually pounding the ground and doing that, or is that just a... It's a prophetic act. Okay. Prophetic act. Got a stake, a tent peg, pound that into the ground. I've got a friend, um, who, she was left a widow, and the house was still mortgaged. She worked as an assistant pastor in a church, and they don't get a huge wage. And the mortgage was kind of crippling because before that it was a double income. And then her husband had passed and now she's still trying to pay the mortgage and exist on a very small amount. And she was finding it utterly frustrating and, and staying in faith and believing God for the house to, for the mortgage to be paid. Do you know what she did? She was in the shower one day and, and the frustration just got to her. She got her fist and she pounded the wall and she said, I command you to be paid in Jesus' name. And within two weeks the house was paid off. 
pound the ground, make a prophetic act. Get a bit righteously angry with the situations that Satan's got you in. But I love verse 28 where Martha said that she believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And she said, after she'd said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, privately whispering to her, the teacher, Jesus, is close at hand and he's asking for you. He's asking for you. Isn't that beautiful? And there will be times when Jesus is asking for us. And do you know when those times are? Is when we didn't get up and run and meet him like Martha did. When we've allowed situations and circumstances to overwhelm us and bring us to a place of grief and sorrow and sadness, hopelessness, whatever it might be, and we're kind of sitting there, kind of believing, kind of not. But Jesus is asking for you. He loves you so much. He's asking for you. Isn't that beautiful? So the times that you feel like, I don't know where God is. I don't know what's happening. Who's had times like that? <laughs> I know I'm not the only one. And so sometimes I can just, you know, we can just sit and think, oh, well, and we kind of become a bit passive. Oh, well, I've surrendered it to God, but we haven't really surrendered it to God. <coughs> We're frustrated and hurt and sad. And we're just wondering, where, where, where are you, God? Where are you? What, what's going on in my life? But in those times, do you know, that's a reflection of Jesus saying, Suzette, I'm asking for you. Where are you, girl? So often what we feel is a reflection of what God feels. You know when you feel so hungry for the Lord, you, you just I'm so hungry I can't get enough of him? It's because he's hungry for you. Often what we feel is a reflection. So when we sort of sit in our rooms and we go, God, I don't know where you are, I don't know what's going on, the Father's up there saying, Suzette, I'm calling you. I can fix this, but I don't even interact. Mm -hmm. But we need to have a redeal, and that's a little bit more than being passive. So don't leave the conversation too quickly. Mary had left the conversation, so Jesus had to ask for her. She'd gone. And you know when, um, and this is another, this, this impacted me as a single mum, when uh, Hagar had been kicked out by Abram and he'd given her a bit of a lunch and a bit of water for, for alimony and <laughs> child support and everything, and things get really hard, she puts her son down under a bush and then she withdraws and moves away because she, it's too painful for her to, be, to see what her son is going through. So she removes herself physically from the situation, but she had removed herself emotionally. And quite often we can remove ourselves emotionally because it's too painful. But if you remove yourself, God sees you. He knows exactly where you are. He's got the exact remedy that you need. But when we remove ourselves emotionally from what God wants to speak into our lives, it makes it harder to come back. God actually sent an angel to speak to Hagar. So he's asking for you. So if Jesus is asking, we have left the conversation too early close the book before we'd finished reading the chapter, whatever you want to say. Going down, um, so Mary, my, Mary had arisen and gone out, verse 32. When Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she dropped down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And that is exactly what Martha said. If you had been here, my brother would have not have died. Exactly the same phrase, but um, her faith was in the past. Martha's faith was in the future, because I know you can raise him again at, you know, in the last days at that time, in the future. I know you can do it then. 
but Mary had her faith had just dried up. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. You weren't here, my brother's dead, end of story. She closed the conversation. So Jesus had to open it up. Is this making sense? So in verse 33, Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews who came with her sobbing and he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Now that's an interesting thing. In the Greek, he's indignant and stirred with anger. You might find some translations say that. But in the Aramaic, he is only tender and compassionate and his heart is melted with compassion. So the Aramaic is, you know, like he's just so compassionate. One of the reasons is because it's a grief for a fallen world entangled with sin, sorrow and death, that it was not anything like what the Father had envisaged it to be. He knew it was going to turn out that way, but it wasn't what the Father had wanted. And so his compassion just overflows. And sometimes people are not healed because we lack compassion. If you look at the number of times that Jesus healed, he was moved with compassion. He taught with compassion. He fed with compassion. Um, so it's recognising all of those things. So in verse 34, Jesus said, Where have you lain him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. So where have you, not just the body of Lazarus, but where have you put down your dreams? Where have you put down your destiny? Where are the things that God put in your heart like inventions? Where has, when God has put stuff in your heart and you've laid them down, where are they? Because we need to be able to take Jesus to that place where they've been buried. Bring this story back into your own life. What have you buried? It can be pain. We can bury emotional pain because it's too hard. There's a whole lot of stuff we can bury. We can bury hope, dreams. We can bury, now I've said that, I can't think of anything we can bury, but there's lots of things we can bury. You know, destiny, like who am I to do what God's called me to do, like God wouldn't really call me. We bury a lot of stuff. And when we can't make sense of things, we bury it. Because in our Western mind, we've got to be able to have a, a reason why. And sometimes we just don't know the reason. So where have you laid down what you need to pick up again? What needs to be resurrected in your life? What needs to come to life again? Hope, faith, destiny, the future? And Jesus wept. And sometimes, you know, Jesus weeps over our lives because we've lain things down, because we've left the conversation too early, we've closed the book before we've finished reading the chapter, we've left the purpose that God intended to happen We've turned away, we've walked away because we haven't understood, we haven't lived by John 5.19, what is the Father saying? I don't want to do anything on my own strength. What's the purpose? So the purpose for Lazarus dying was that their faith would be strengthened, that they would see the power of the resurrection so that when Jesus actually died on the cross, they would remember what had happened to Lazarus and hope would come. <coughs> There's a whole lot of things but Jesus sometimes weeps over our life because out of his compassion, it's not going down the path that he wanted it to, but it's gone down the path that we've chosen because of free will. And he weeps because it doesn't have to be that way. Is this making sense? The stuff in the Bible, personalize it, bring it back to yourself. Jesus is the word of God. He is the living word of God. So in verse 38, Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, verse 37, 36, the Jews said, see how Jesus loved Lazarus. 
But some of them said, couldn't he have opened a blind man's eyes if we prevented this man from dying? And we say stuff like that. We say, well, God, you, you've done this. Why didn't you step in here? Why didn't you do that for me? And we come back and we actually accuse God of not doing what we think he should have done. They were accusing him. They were accusing Jesus. Who does he think he is? He's healed him, but he didn't step into the one he loves. We do the same thing. We talk about God sometimes in horrible ways. Sometimes I think he's got the most dysfunctional family on the planet. <laughs> but he loves us and he never gives up on us, ever. So we've got to put down our accusations or our insinuations, or our inferences. And say, so, you know what, I don't know. And, and sometimes after, after getting this revelation, I've had to say, God, I'm sorry, but I didn't even know what your purpose was in what I went through. I had no idea what you were doing. I just wanted <laughs> to get out of it. I just wanted healing, or I just wanted this, or I just wanted that. I just wanted it finished. But I never once stopped to ask, what was your purpose? And how could I intentionally live with you through this so that you get the glory and the fame of the name of Jesus is spread and I'm brought into the destiny that you've got for me? So in verse 38, Jesus again, sighing repeatedly, deeply disquieted, approached the tomb. It was a cave and a boulder lay against the entrance to it. So in four days, they actually seal the tomb shut. So this was the fourth day, but it had not yet been sealed. Jesus said, take away the stone. And sometimes, you know, the stone is in our heart. I know when I got divorced, the big stone over my heart was no man's ever going to divorce me again, so I'm not getting into a relationship, right? Finished, over, never again, finished. The stone over my heart. We put stones over our thought processes sometimes. We put stones across the tomb that holds our hope. We put stones across that tomb that holds our future, our destiny, because we gave up on it, because it didn't come the way we thought, because we think now we're too old, we're too this, we're too that, nothing's going to happen, what's the point anyway? And so we've shoved it in the tomb so we can forget about it, and we've, we've put the stone across. But it's not sealed. And that stone can be rolled away at any time. Because God wants you to live your destiny more than you want to.